Hello and welcome to the Young Texas and Reformed podcast. I'm your host, Taylor DeSoto. And in today's episode, we are going to be reviewing an article by Mark Ward, uh, posted on the Gospel Coalition, and it was written July 26th, 2018. So certainly nothing new, uh, but I mean, from 2018 to, to now, it kind of seems like it's all been one year. I mean, it's crazy how fast time has passed since then, but but uh, I can assure you from what I've kind of read in a uh, a quick scan of the article, everything seems to be relevant still. It's what people are still saying. And I, I wanted to make this video on the tail end of the last video to kind of demonstrate, hey, this is the general perception of, of what the conversation is. So this article is called Three Ways to Graciously Engage K- KJV-Only Believers. So, I mean, let's take a look. Does he provide three ways that are helpful and are they gracious? He begins by saying, Don Carson pled with them for realism 40 years ago, and James White urged them to trust modern translations 20 years ago. But I sense that conservative evangelicalism has now given up on critiquing King James Version onlyism. I mean, a couple things here. Uh, the fact that Mark Ward's ministry exists demonstrates that, conser- you know, I assume he calls himself a conservative evangelical, right? I mean, that that's what I believe he presents himself as. And his whole ministry is based on this very topic. So I think lacking in self-awareness maybe here. And, you know, I, I, I can name, <clears throat> I don't know, 15 different sources right now who, you know, will casually make a post, like the Reform Sage, will casually make a, a post on Facebook, you know, critiquing King James Version onlyism. Uh, there, are, there are big voices that, that kind of will throw that out there. The, the trend of critiquing so-called King James onlyism certainly isn't becoming tired for them. Uh, it's becoming tired for King James Version only as so-called, uh, but, but they certainly do not get tired of doing it. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what, what that statement is supposed to mean. Maybe he has some sort of internal polling that, that demonstrates that. I, I, I don't see it. Anyway, he continues, But there are tens or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of KJV-only Christians around the world, and a new generation is taking leadership in the movement. So we have them, we have the movement. Who are these people? Who is the, the ominous them? What is the movement? Uh, Let's see if he describes these things. It's time to make another gentle appeal, he carries on. But what else can be said? I urge a threefold strategy. So what else can be said other than what I guess D.A. Carson and James White have said? Well, a lot can be said. The the actual arguments can be addressed. I think D.A. Carson and James White do an okay job addressing, I mean, they do an okay job at addressing the sort of Ruckman, Gip, Ripplinger types. Uh, but what ultimately, they, they don't base their argumentation theologically, uh, which is why they fail. They, they approach the arguments from an evidential perspective, not a theological perspective. And so that's why I say they do an okay job. Because really, the, 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 uh, the simple reality is that Ripplinger, Gip, Ruckman type KJV onlyism uh, is a very simple refutation, and I've done so on my blog, uh, so in, in about a paragraph. So, so I mean, the fact that they had to write a whole book, I mean, you could write a pamphlet at the best, you know, just a little brochure refuting it, and it would be done. That's all that needs to be said. And yet they wrote entire books, built entire ministries off of these, you know, refuting so-called King James onlyism, but... As I pointed out, it's not just King James Version onlyism. It's anyone who reads a King James Version. It's anybody who has rebelled uh, against the modern version only zeitgeist. Uh, that's who these works are actually targeting. Is is the people who would have the audacity to read uh, the KJV, or even to reject the ESV? You know, say it's a bad translation. That that's what those works are for. Not refuting the. I mean, the fact. That, that people think you need a PhD to refute the, the re-inspiration type King James Version onlyism is a problem. It's, it's, it's a very simple argument to refute. Um, 
and and I'll post the article where I where I do that. I guess if I if I remember. So we we already have kind of some vague. We have some generalizations, right? We have the ominous them. We have the movement, and you know who are these people? Let's let's hope we get a definition for the for this this group. So what else can be said? So Mark Ward feels that he has something to add on top of D.A. Carson and James White. He says, I urge a threefold strategy focused on English translation, not Greek textual criticism. Okay, so he basically says like, okay, D.A. Carson, James White, like I don't recommend your strategy. This is what I recommend. This is the best way to love and persuade our KJV only brothers and sisters. The first is he says, listen and understand. <clears throat> so let's see, let's see if he gets, you know, the, the purpose of listening and understanding, uh, in theory is to make sure that your argument is formulated against the right position, right? Uh, you don't want to develop an argument against what they call a straw man. So this is what he says. He says, KJV only views tend to fall between two poles. One extreme makes strident claims for the absolute perfection of the KJV, reviewing it as perfect, a product of divine re-inspiration. So that would be your Ruckman, Gip, Ripplinger type. The other poll prefers the KJV out of an aesthetic sense or the belief that valuable unifying tradition shouldn't be given up lightly. Uh, I, I would say on the second part that that might be an unfair categorization on that end of the spectrum. I would say... Uh, if, if we're going, you know, the extreme re-inspiration camp, the other side of it is basically people who just prefer the KJV. I, I don't think necessarily tradition has, a, tradition has anything to do with it. I would say that's one step in. So on, on that end, you have like, I, I've just read the KJV forever. I prefer it. I know it. All my scripture is memorized in it. That's, that's the very far end of it. One step in is they appreciate for a traditional reason. This is what the church has read. This is what maybe even my church has read. Uh, that's kind of one step in, and we've kind of pushed them together into one. I suspect uh, to be able to use this word here, traditions, because uh, that's a little bit of a, a boogeyman uh, to the gospel coalition types. He continues. More than likely, the KJV only brothers and sisters you'll run into are between these two poles or these poles. So he he's now going to give a definition of what he considers to be the broad the broad group that we're actually addressing. They're part of the mainstream King James only movement, which means if you listen to them, you'll find they're not technically KJV only. So at least we have him admitting that he's not using terms with integrity here, right? Uh, we, we have the admission here. He's like, well, they're not technically KJV only, but they are KJV onlyists, right? Do you, do you see how, I mean, it's just lacking <clears throat> integrity, right? You, you wouldn't say, uh, I, you know, I use the Trinity as an example because it's a good example. You wouldn't say, you know, these, this group of Trinitarians, well, they're not technically Trinitarians. It's like, well, then don't call them Trinitarians, Right. In, in the willingness to, to, to do that demonstrates the kind of, like I said, integrity that we're dealing with here. Why not just use a different term? If they're not KJV only, why do you need to categorize them in the same group as the KJV only? Because the only thing that we've really we've really kind of pointed out is that the KJV only they they're, they're you know, even on the on the one end of the spectrum, they're traditionalists. On the other, they believe in divine re-inspiration. We haven't exactly gotten to mainstream KJV onlyism yet, but we already have sort of building ideas of what he wants you to think about this group of people, the them, the movement, right? So let's see if he continues. The mainstream KJV only movement insists that its ultimate concern is not actually the KJV. And so, see, they insist, they insist, but that's, that, that's not really true. It's the full preservation, and see he puts in quotes here. So I mean, this is this is just chock full of subversive language. I mean, it's a it's a very biased take, which we, we would expect from Mark Ward. So that's not a big deal. Of the Greek and Hebrew texts from which the KJV was translated, namely the Masoretic Hebrew and the Greek Textus Receptus or TR. KJV onlyism is actually officially TR onlyism. So this, this just demonstrates that he hasn't been listening. Uh, 
because there are, I mean, he's recognized that there are KJV onlyists that actually reject the TR. They say if we are going to use the, the any Greek, it should be corrected by the KJV. And usually those types will uh, say, well, why would we need the TR if we have the English KJV? So he hasn't been listening very carefully because technically and actually TR onlyism is not King James version onlyism. There are so-called TR onlyists who read the NKJV, the MAV, the Geneva Bible. And, and this is the biggest problem I have with these people. They, they talk, they, they say, listen and understand we need to be gracious. This is the absolute opposite of that. He's demonstrating that he doesn't, he's writing the article. He's the authority. I mean, it's Mark Ward for goodness sake. And he doesn't know, he doesn't have half a clue of what he's talking about, or he does. And he's writing this way to paint a certain picture that, that isn't true. So it's not officially TR onlyism in according to the way he's framed the discussion. There are KJV onlyists. There are I don't think there's any TR onlyist because what does KJV only mean? It means you only read the KJV. Would a TR onlyist mean? What would that mean then? You know, it's like uh, if KJV onlyism means reading only the KJV, what does TR onlyism mean? It's like a multiple choice question on a fifth grade exam, and uh, we have failed the logic test here. So TR onlyism as as a label is sort of a pejorative, and that's the value it has, right? But it shows that we it, we can't we can't consistently use these definitions without actually meaning a lot more than what the, the name would imply. We haven't we haven't really defined anything. Uh, you have Mark Ward saying that they're not technically KJV only, they're TR only, but they're you know what is he saying? Let's see if he makes a point. Let's see if he's explained how to listen and understand. Uh, evangelical biblical scholarship looks at all the differences among Greek New Testament manuscripts and intextual criticism takes up the complicated challenge of calling out copyist errors. See, that, that's just not it. And even I think something that Mark Ward has written recently would, would, would probably be more accurate than the way he's described that there. KJV onlyism looks at those same differences and feels them to be a threat to the stability of the Christian faith. So it adopts the TR and rejects modern textual criticism. <clears throat> so from a writing perspective, he hasn't actually explained anything here in terms of his, his header. Uh, if Mark Ward thinks he's been listening and understanding this pair, these, these couple paragraphs, these five paragraphs clearly demonstrate he has not been listening. Uh, so, so first of all, evangelical biblical scholarship, uh, what does that mean? Looks at all the differences. It would be textual scholarship. They look at all the Greek New Testament manuscripts and in textual criticism, it takes up the complicated challenge of calling. No, that's not what they're doing. Uh, the, the effort of textual criticism is way more than just, we're, we're just getting rid of the, the handwriting error, the spelling mistakes. No, right, right now they're, they're, they're essentially trying to find a, a hypothetical text and they're demonstrating they can't do it. They, they have abandoned the, the, the search for the original, at least in their methodology. You know, in their hearts, they say, we really want to find the original. I see no reason to give up on that goal. But then you look at how they're actually doing it. And, and by, by the way, most of them are not conservative evangelicals or even evangelical. Uh, the ones actually doing the work he's talking about that make it into your Bible. Uh, no, they're, they're, you know, outside of the translation teams typically are, but the people in Munster, Germany, very progressive. So he hasn't explained how to listen and understand. And in fact, he seems himself to have issues listening and understanding. Um, he basically has boiled it down to this. KJV onlyism looks at the same differences and feels them to be a threat. So it's tradition. We're threatened. We're scared. I mean, this is, this is just, it's polemic language. It's political language. It's, it, it's not into, it's not intellectually honest and it's not uh it's not it's not writing that has a whole lot of integrity because when i look at the errors in the critical text i view them as errors not a threat i'm like oh no it's a threat i just look at that and say that's just wrong and and you can you can believe it or not 
call something wrong without being threatened or scared. But that's what they do, right? That's what that's what people who gaslight other people do, right? Uh, if you were to if you were to confront a, an emotional manip emotionally manipulative person, and you say, "Hey, hey, you you were your behavior was inappropriate here, and this is how it was inappropriate. I would like for you to stop." Uh, behaving in this way around me and my family and they would say why because you feel threatened because you feel insecure because you're so scared that your children might find something out that you didn't tell them what are you afraid of they make a legitimate concern into a you issue into an emotional issue and th this is how they write this is how effeminate men write and mark ward is the king of it so uh, him and Elijah Hickson, they, they all do this, right? They, they make legitimate, uh, legitimate objections into, they make them out to be emotionally charged, traditional, coming from a traditionalist kind of place. When, if we're talking about the majority, that that's not what the problem is. You know, what, what they fail to often recognize is that a lot of these men and women saw the shift from the King James Version to the NIV and ESV and NAS and NASB and CSB, and they see how much of a mess it is. They see the fruit of it. You know, a lot of my audience might not know this, but the transition from the King James to modern versions is very new in church history. Extraordinary, extraordinarily new in church history. And, and yet they write as though, like, this is just something that has been tried and tested. Listen, the critical text isn't done. They haven't even finished their Bible. They don't say that any one of their own Bibles is accurate. And yet the people that are sitting here saying, yeah, well, our Bible has been accurate for 400 years and we trust it. Oh, they're the problem. You know, if you take a faith lens and you look at who is more faithful in those two situations, Clearly, the King James people win. Now, they're trying to make an argument from an intellectual, scientific perspective, but when you actually listen to their polemics, it it's a threat. They're threatened. They're traditionalists. They're this thing and that thing. Uh, it, it, it just makes them feel comfortable <clears throat> to stick with the KJV. It, no, it couldn't be about a legitimate objection. So they resort to manipulative language. That's the problem. Uh, it's a huge problem from 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 an argument constructive construction perspective. Uh, it 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 shows that they don't actually have an argument. So his sec so he's he's failed to accomplish anything meaningful in point one. Uh, he hasn't done anything to add to D. A. Carson or James White, so he's o for one so far. He says two. Don't talk about textual criticism. Okay, so let's see what he wants to talk about. I suggest you take a step back. You must refuse to talk about the textual criticism with KJV-only Christians. I'm not saying it's worthless to teach the truth on a topic. <laughs> so see how he's comparing textual criticism is the truth. It's, you know, it's not a problem to talk about the truth, but hear me out. But now it's probably not the time. So why is it not the time to talk about textual criticism? Is it because your own textual scholars have refuted everything that you, you said 10 years ago? Is that why it's not, it's time to, it's not time to talk? After you've been embarrassed and made a fool in front of the world? Oh, so we're not talking about them now. All right, let's continue. So, God calls few Christians, KJV only or not, to learn Kine Greek. This, so now he's going to go the Greek language road, which is what he loves to do. I know Kine Greek. No, he doesn't. He knows, he knows how to use Greek tools and do diagramming and everything like that. Sorry, my dog is being obnoxious. Um... This means comparatively few people on any side of the KJV debate have ever examined the evidence. Instead, most people in the church have formed their text critical views secondhand from authorities they trust. That, that much is true. He's accurate on that. This is natural and not necessarily bad. We, we all outsource complex judgments to people whose expertise we would have trouble proving exactly. So that's sort of true. But the way that Mark Ward has articulated it in this other places, and let's see if he does it here, is basically say, you're not qualified. And the textual scholars do this kind of gatekeeping. They say, you don't know anything. You're not in the academic guild. You're not in the textual guild. 
shut up, sit down. I mean, Peter Gurry literally told me, he's like, he, he asked me, what makes you think you have the right to have a blog about this stuff? That's what he asked me. And, uh, as, uh, I mean, th this kind of, th th these are toxic people. And they, they, what he's saying here is if you don't have the right PhD or whatever, then sit down and shut up. You don't have the right. Everyone does it. Everybody sits down and shuts up. No, but every Christian has the ability to parse doctrine. Because we get our doctrine from the Bible, and you don't need a PhD to read the Bible. Thanks to the King James Version, by the way. This means your disagreement with the average KJV defender is not actually about textual criticism, but about which authorities are worth trusting. Carson, Carson versus Ruckman, White versus Waite. So see, there we go. The mainstream is Ruckman and Waite. See how confusing this picture is? Are they, are they TR only or are they Ruckmanites? Is Waite one of their authorities? See, if you don't know who Waite is and you go and Google him, you're going to get a really interesting picture. You don't know who Ruckman is, Google him. You're going to get a really interesting picture. But none of which describe what I would call what he's saying the mainstream KJV only or the TR only position. And that brings me to the point in the last video. These people are intentionally confusing us, confusing the reader. They're not trying to be clear. And they're not actually communicating anything. So if, if he says, don't talk about textual criticism, it's because they don't know Greek. We're just trusting authorities. And the authorities they trust are Ruckman and White. You won't get him to trust responsible authors by having him read their attacks on his viewpoint. You'll do this by giving him other edifying books by those who have produced our modern evangelical Bible translations, hoping he'll sense intuitively that they are not his enemies. This is your long game. Yes, the Trojan horses in the evangelical church like Dan Wallace are the reason. I mean, this is actually a good strategy. Uh, say, hey, here's Dan Wallace. He's a seminary professor and he speaks at all these churches and he's a conservative. Uh, but if you actually look at what he says, there's nothing conservative about Dan Wallace's view on scripture. Uh, he says we do not have now in any of any critical Greek texts or in any translations exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Even if we did, we would not know it. There are many, many places in which the text of the New Testament is uncertain. Does that sound like a conservative position to you? But this is the guy they're going to give you as a Trojan horse. But your short game needs to be needs to give up on textual criticism. As Dan Wallace, <laughs> I mean, I can't make this stuff up, has labor to show only a tiny percentage of textual differences are both meaningful and viable. Yeah, if, if, if our data set is 500,000 textual variants and a tiny port, what's a tiny portion of 500,000, you think? It's meaningful. The difference between, and then he's going to use an example that no one debates about. The star came to rest over baby Jesus and the star came and stood over him is not worth a fight. So this is another tactic. See, these are the kinds of errors we're talking about. Even though everybody knows it's the kind of differences that remove entire passages, entire verses, entire words from the Holy Scriptures. That's what we're talking about, Mark Ward. You know it, you snake. So then he says, graciously agree to disagree with KJV devotees' preference for the TR and move on. So I guess the strategy so far is listen and then don't talk to them. <laughs> I mean, this is the, I mean, point them to Dan Wallace. So listen, understand, point them to Dan Wallace and then say, well, I agree to disagree. So don't actually have a conversation with them. And then three, talk about English only. Most lay persons do not need to understand the canons of Greek New Testament textual criticism, uh, but, but they are telling lay people that you need to. I mean, listen to James White, listen to the, the authorities. They're saying you need, to, James White outright says, you need, to, you need to know textual criticism to do apologetics. So, I mean, that's the push right now. But I agree you don't need to know anything about New Testament textual criticism. I think it's a frivolous and foolish effort. But here's something every KJV reader ought to know. Elizabethan English is no longer fully intelligible. See, this is just a lie. And, and it, it, it's despicable because 
seventh and eighth graders, and first of all, the KJV isn't pure Elizabethan English. It's it's early modern English. Shakespeare is much harder to read than the KJV. Uh, but Mark Ward continues to tell this lie to make himself feel better at night, or for whatever reason. I don't know why he tells this lie, uh, be because Shakespeare is much harder than the KJV in, in terms of its prose. Uh, yet he continues to say that this is this is true, that it's archaic, that it's unintelligible. He's literally saying the English language is no longer fully intelligible. You want to know what an unintelligible is? Read Chaucer. Read Middle English. Uh, pe people, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves is actually when people say that the King James is Old English. Look up Beowulf in its original language in Old English and tell me if that is anything similar to the King James Version. The, the problem is ignorance here. And people like Mark Ward propagate this ignorance on huge platforms such as the Gospel Coalition who would be happy to have anybody on here to critique the Bible. And 1 Corinthians 4, 1, 14, or 1 Corinthians 14 tells us explicitly and repeatedly that intelligibility is necessary for education. No. Uh, and he, he twists this passage um, for his purposes, which is what snakes do. He says, If your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. Uh, what is this talking about? I'll let, my, I'll let my audience go and do some Matthew Henry commentary here. Because uh, apparently Mark Ward can't read a commentary. And we do know that Mark Ward struggles with, with reading comprehension, though. So we have to give him a little bit of a break here. So even KJV extremists know it contains dead words. And in a, so here we go. This is this is charged language. See, we're, we're not trying to be honest and actually communicate anything meaningful. And this is my problem I have with men like Mark Ward. They are not writing directly. They are not writing to a purpose because so far his purpose is to listen to them, recommend Dan Wallace, and then tell them that we agree to disagree. Uh, that, that's what he said so far. And so what's the purpose of this third one? Talk about English only. He says, but there is another. And then he talks about his false friends, <clears throat> which is his, his big hobby horse. Uh, but but what is he? What is his purpose here? Translators could not have picked a future words like halt, remove, and commend, uh, which are all English words, uh, and shouldn't be held responsible to notice how these words have evolved over the past four centuries. William Tyndall died to give God's word to the plowboy, not to the specialist in in historical Englishes. It's just English, Mark Ward, and the specialists would agree with me on that. Uh, so, the problem here. Is he saying, talk about English so you can show them that their Bible is archaic. But like he admitted, we know there are dead words. What he so-called dead words. They're just words that you need a dictionary to learn for the first time you read it. And then you know them. Like any other book that you would read without knowing a word. I mean, when I read Harry Potter for the first time, there, there was words in there that I had to look up. Is Harry Potter more important than the Holy Bible? To Mark Ward, yeah. So... Then he, then he goes on, beautiful translation, which I guess is his conclusion? Yeah. So so we've already established, that I've said this in a number of places, Mark Ward is a, is a very poor writer. Uh, clearly he hasn't followed a thought throughout, hasn't clearly identified what, he, he identifies his purpose and then doesn't say anything towards that purpose. And then he finishes here called with a paragraph called beautiful translation. So what does he have to say to finish? Of course, the KJV is not entirely unintelligible, and it surely is beautiful. I have always enjoyed the challenge of reading it. So this is the, the reason they say things like this is to kind of give them some cover fire. So they write, you know, they, they write what they really want to say. You know, the, these people are extremists. They uh, are traditionalists. They are emotively charged and things like this. And then they finish by saying nice things about the KJV. So then when someone says, you're just attacking KJV only us in the KJV. And he said, well, no, look, I said it was a beautiful translation. And they think that somehow uh, negates what, they, what they've actually said. When I encourage my brothers and sisters, it's so beautiful that I encourage them to stop using it. That's, that's what he's saying. So we see a contradiction of ideas. <clears throat> if you had a, a beautiful piece of art in your, in your house, and someone came into the house and said, wow, that's an old art painting. I mean, it, 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 it's beautiful, but you need to take it down. And what does that imply? That it's no longer beautiful. 
So he, he, he is logic. He is contradicting himself when he does this and he does this charade, but the undiscerning functionally illiterate people that read the, the gospel coalition do not pick up on this kind of stuff. These kinds of word games and manipulation, uh, and, and polemic strategies, rhetoric. He goes on and says, I do so uh, as my favorite linguist, John McWhorter says of Shakespeare, not because we are uncultured or incapable of effort, but because language is always moving. And, and this is what they, they use as an excuse. Well, language is always evolving. Not, not in the way that you think that it does. Written language evolves very slowly. And the written English that we're, we used to be taught to write in schools has always been very different than vernacular, commonly colloquial, uh, colloquially spoken English. Uh, this is just the case. So we, we historically, the last hundred years, we've always been able to read and write at a higher level than we speak. That's, that's always been the case. If the point of Bible reading were Anglophilic and culturalization, so that sounds like a critical race thing to me, Anglophilic or early modern English decoding practice, how disrespectful, how utterly disrespectful the sentence is. That makes me sick modern English decoding practice, then giving people KJVs would be ideal. But if the point is understanding what God said, then people should be given the Bible in their English, not someone else's. Well, Mark Ward had a, had, had a, a shot at exegeting a passage and failed. So I don't think he has any position to critique other people's reading comprehension. KJV onlyism is not a Christian liberty issue like eating meat offered to idols. It makes void the word of God by human tradition. One archaizing extreme at a time. I pray that my brethren's consciences will one day be liberated to read more than just the KJV. But consciences should not be treated lightly, even when misinformed. The safest way to push people past the unsound objections of their consciences to appeal directly to God's word and let his spirit illuminate it for them. Mark Ward is a snake. I mean, this is, this is very, very, I mean, how insulting that he says, if you, you know, if your point is just decoding ancient language, sure, read the KJV, but if you actually want to read God's word, you have to read modern translations. Which one, Mark Ward? Which text? Your Bible just came out with 33 or so new readings. Hundreds of others, which are uncertain. See, this is, this is what makes me so angry is he's grandstanding as, as I'm the one that's righteous. I have the correct position. None of his scholars say that they have a Bible. Let's say Dan Wallace one more time, who he pointed to in this article. We do not have now in any of our critical Greek texts, or in any translations, exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Even if we did, we would not know it. There are many, many places in which the text of the New Testament is uncertain. End quote. So that's the faithful position, Mark Ward. You're a snake. I mean, this is just, it's, it's, it's sad that people buy into this stuff because on one end he'll say we need to be gracious, but then he ends his article with, with his heart. This is what he wants to say the whole time. And he, and he opens it up. What did I say he was going to do? He's going to butter you up. This is the scholarly play. They do the handshake and then they say things that are extremely harsh and if true, very condemning. It's not a Christian liberty issue. So these aren't his brethren, as he has said time and time and time again. It's not an open hand issue to him. This makes the word of God void, he says. So when I call him a snake and people recoil and say, whoa, he's not a snake. He's a nice guy. He's a Christian. Well, he's taking a stand here. So let's be objective. Are we going to be effeminate thinkers or are we going to be logical thinkers here? Are we going to be men or 
strong women of God and call this crap for what it is. He's saying, first of all, he hasn't defined KJV onlyism, only to say it's everybody from the extreme Ruckmanites down to the people that prefer the KJV. That's who he's talking about. And what he's saying is that these, this is not a liberty issue. This is not an open hand issue. This is closed hand. And these people are making void the word of God. Tell me, is that a gracious person? Is that a person who is seeing the issue clearly? I think he's saying the quiet part out loud here, what they're all thinking, that the KJV is not the Bible. Because that's what this means, right? It makes the word of God void. So the KJV is not the word of God, right? So how, how gracious is that particular position? How well has he listened? Has he accurately defined what a KJV onlyist is? Who exactly he's talking about when he says that this is not a liberty issue? Who is he talking about? when he says that they make the word of God void, because my perception is so far, everyone who reads the KJV, that's how he's defined it in the article. And then he goes on and says, but their consciences, we shouldn't take them lightly, even when misinformed. And he goes back to the way he talks. The whole article can be defined by this. All the rest of it was wasted words because he didn't say anything of meaning. He said, listen to them. Let them feel heard. Then point them to Dan Wallace. Agree to disagree. And then I guess if the conversation continues after agreeing to disagree, point out the errors in their Bible by using my work. Then tell them that, well, the KJV is beautiful, but it needs to be retired because this isn't a Christian liberty issue. This is you making the word of God void. Null and void. So actually... Uh, you're not a Christian. That's what's being said in this article. If, if we read through all of the elegant or not so elegant uh, niceties, we see what he's actually saying. We see how sharp Mark Ward's tongue actually is and what he actually means. This is it. You know, part of this article, I, I, wanted, I want people to see this stuff because... Mark Ward gets away with it because he talks with a little bit of a effeminate lisp and he's really nice. And so people give him a pass. But this right here is who Mark Ward is. He doesn't think that reading the KJV is a Christian liberty issue. If you read the KJV alone, you are making the word of God null and void. According to him. And I want you to sit on that for a while. Because this is, this is what is being pushed out there in the mainstream. See, this is the average person. I mean, this, this person would probably say he's a very articulate and well-studied uh, defender of the critical text. But as we can see, he hasn't defined what KJV-onlyism is. He hasn't let, told us uh, what group he's actually talking about when he calls them heretics. And he hasn't actually offered any great advice other than don't engage with them. Point them to Dan Wallace. That's what this whole article is saying. So what do we make of this? Am I right in calling this kind of behavior snakish? Am I right in saying that the author who wrote this is a snake? I mean, he's writing on the Gospel Coalition after all. And this is back in 2018. You know, I'm tired. I'm tired of people letting... I'm tired of conservatives giving a hall pass for this kind of stuff. Either let's speak to it and let these people know they're in error and that they're manipulative and they don't, they're not concerned with the truth, obviously, because nothing in this article really points to that. We have to start calling these men out. We have to make them ashamed to say what they've said, because this is embarrassing. This, this is embarrassing. This is not gracious. It's not charitable, as he loves to say he is. This is harsh. 
this is harsher than than probably what I would would say about the critical text. Way harsher. Then here we are. So anyway, uh, that's been it for the the Young Texas System Reform podcast. I'm your host Taylor DeSoto. Hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, it's a little fiery, but I've been heating it up lately because this is an inexcusable. This is inexcusable, and that's how I believe. This needs to stop. Uh, if you're going to listen and understand, listen and understand. And don't mischaracterize everybody for the purpose of your personal vendetta against the King James Version. And that's it for today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And we will see you all in the next episode.